Chris Hatfield is a highly decorated aviator, the first Canadian astronaut to walk in space, the first to command the International Space Station. And then there's this. This is ground control to Major Tom. You've really made the gravy. Commander Hatfield joins us now from Toronto. And Chris, that has to be one of the most popular performances on the internet or on social media to be more specific. How did it come about? Yes, it's been seen an incredible number of times, hundreds of millions around the world, which was a big surprise to me. It, it was really uh, inadvertent. It, I, I've been a musician for my whole life, uh, and my son sent me an email while I was on the space station asking me to record that, and, and it just started as a father-son project, but um, the song, uh, I don't know, it probably shows the real creative genius of David Bowie himself, because when I recorded the, the audio track, just the voice track of that song, it, it's as if it had soaked up the place a little bit. It sounded more ethereal than I expected, and, and then other people wanted to put some instrumentals underneath, and then I made the video one weekend, and, and my son edited it together, and, uh, and it's been amazing to see the worldwide result. And it made you a rock star. Well, let's talk about space exploration. 2014 appears to be a banner here for space exploration. We had the Orion launch, we had the Mars rover, we had a spacecraft being put on a comet. Um, how significant have all these developments been over the past year? Well, you can measure significance a lot of ways. I, th I think the significance of them is the number of people that are aware of what's going on. There, there's, of course, a, a vast array of stuff going on in space right now with all the satellites and, and probes. But sometimes it's just not you know, newsworthy. But it, within the last few months, there have been some incredibly interesting and, and inherently uh, intriguing and fascinating events, like you say, to launch Orion, to have uh, some of the commercial uh, privatizing vehicles really making some strides for it and to be on other planets and to land on a comet I mean all of that it, it just uh, tickles the imagination and I think that is great that people see some of the fruit of all of the labor that goes on in, in exploring the universe when we look at how technology is developing there has been an emphasis uh, recently on more robotic vehicles uh, out there in space, uh, especially the vehicle that got onto Mars, the Curiosity rover. Has that in some way lessened the role of the astronaut, the pilot? No, I really don't think so. Uh, we always coexist with machinery. That's what allows us to live the way we do. I, I don't think the, uh, the invention of the washing machine has diminished the role of the human being. You know, I think it's just an enabler. It allows us then to decide what we want to do next, to allow us how to understand things better, to free up our time um, to do something that really requires the, the intricacy and the immediacy of, of human reaction. So um, I think it'll always be both. It's, it's always both on the surface of the Earth, and, and there's nothing magically different w once you ride a rocket ship. And people are inherently interested in people as well. How does this affect us? What does it mean for our future? What do we learn from it that affects us? And so I, I, I think it's a really important cooperation between the robots we've invented and then the things that we learn as a result. All right, and I think the key point that you made there is what do we do next? Uh, these vehicles are really going to tell us whether we're going to be able to survive out there, uh, wouldn't they? Well, we have uh, six people living up on the space station, but that's, you know, that's just right close to home. We need to decide where next, whither next, what makes sense. Um, and if we're going to decide, say, to go permanently live on the moon and not just, not just be there for a, a day or two, or to go further and eventually, of course, to go as far as Mars and beyond, what don't we know yet? We, you know, what, what threats are there? What, what are we going to get wrong? We don't want to be like a lot of the early explorers who lost their lives trying to discover things that we didn't understand. We, we have the ability now maybe to decrease the, the personal human risk while still getting the same results. And that's what the robots do so well, uh, teaching us about the, all of the threats that exist between here and the moon and here and Mars, teaching us about the places that are worth going to or maybe places that are inherently not worth going to. I think it's a logical process and I've been really delighted to have been in the thick of it for the last uh, 25 years. Right, and when we look at the next best step for space exploration, you talked about the creation of a permanent base. I mean, where would that base be? Would it be on the moon? Would it be on Mars? Or would we just do it step by step, first the moon, then maybe Mars? I, I think 
when someone is writing the story of this 100 years from now, it'll look obvious. Right now, of course, there are so many choices. It, it's like standing at, at an at a ice cream store and trying to choose which one is the right one for today. Uh, but looking back, I think the, the logical extension of human exploration will be send out probes as many places as possible, look for the destinations that make sense, and then incrementally work our way there. And we've done that. We've sent out probes through the whole solar system. There's one on the way to Pluto right now. We've even sent probes with people all the way to the moon. And then we started living in space permanently as a species uh, 14 years ago on the space station. So where next? To me, obviously, the moon. It's only three days away. And we have so many things to get wrong so that we can learn what works right. We don't want to kill ourselves every time we launch. So go to the moon. Use it as a base to understand the Earth the history of the universe, use it as an observatory for the rest of the world on the other, or the rest of the universe on the other side of the moon, and then from that, invent and test and prove and gather the, the fortitude necessary to turn our tails towards Earth and go as far as Mars. There's no big hurry, but it's a natural extension of human exploration, and uh, I think we'll take each lily pad that Providence gave us. We'll go from the space station to the moon to Mars and beyond. There's also one other big exciting development uh, in the uh, past year or so, and that was discovery of the properties of this moon which uh, orbits Jupiter, the Europa moon. Uh, and there's talk of there being extraterrestrial life on this. I mean, that's uh, we're getting into the realm of science fiction here. Oh, yeah, it's amazing how quickly science fiction turns into science fact. Just in my career, I went from dreaming about things with Space Odyssey 2001 to actually flying a reusable spaceship up to a... A international space station, you know, where life does imitate the, the imaginations of art. Um, but to have our robots showing us some of the moons around our other planets that have all of the basic building blocks. They have heat um, coming from different sources. They have water, which of course for our understanding of life is absolutely necessary. They have time. They have change. It's not just stasis, but because of the gravitational forces, it, it, uh, it shifts things. And often, life develops where, where there's a new opportunity uh, on Earth. And so uh, it it's stretches the imagination to think how life could be somewhere besides Earth. But I think it also pushes us to the inevitability of it, to, to think of the, I don't even know what the number is, septillions of planets that exist um, and to find out whether we're alone in the universe or not. It, it's a fundamental human question, and we might, with our own inventions, be close to answering that question really soon. Uh, do you find that there is still a commitment, not just on the part of the United States, but other countries as well, Russia for one, India is getting involved, China is getting involved, European countries are getting involved. Is there a commitment to space exploration right now? I mean, you know, money is tight, as people tell us, budgets are being cut, but we've had more money being put into it recently. Will that continue? Uh, well, money's always been tight. I mean, people think there was some golden age where, where everything was easy. Uh, having been in the astronaut office for 21 years, it's a battle every year, a battle fought uh, at all different levels, uh, from the worker level to try and do the job just right, right up into the administrator level, trying to justify and get their share of, of, uh, of their space agency's budget. Um, and, and it needs to be a battle. You should have to prove the necessity and the worthwhile nature of what you're doing. But at the same time, fascinating things are happening with the money that we're given. And, and it's always going to be that tug of war. But the, the events of the last year, and you mentioned countries uh, that are starting in with their own space agencies, like the United Arab, Arab Emirates as well, have formed a space agency. Um, but private citizens are almost at the cusp now of maybe being able to fly to space. Companies trying to use that government-sponsored invention to then come up with vehicles that might get the cost down low enough to open it up to a whole wider market than just space agencies. So yeah, I, uh, I think it's always a financial um, balance and, and, and struggle, but at the same time, the results are, are right on the edge of, of incredulity, right on the edge of what we can imagine and accomplish. Now, with all these opportunities for space exploration, both public and private, might we see the day soon when Commander Hatfield will be back in space, perhaps doing a follow-up to uh, <laughs> Space Oddity? <laughs> I, I have been so lucky. I mean, I, I basically worked my entire life 
in order to be qualified to command a spaceship, to command the International Space Station, right from a kid through university, becoming a fighter pilot and a test pilot, and then serving 21 years as an astronaut. And, and I, the luck that has come with that, to have flown in space three times um, and to have lived for half a year off the planet, um, I, I, I'm tremendously spoiled. So I, I'm not sure that I'll, I'll have a chance to fly in space again. But I'm really pleased with the opportunities that have been built over that time for other people to fly both within space agencies, but now starting to branch out where there may be um, professional test pilots who are also astronauts. That's, that's a really new thing. And, uh, and that continuum, from my point of view, more is a sense of, of like parenthood, of, of being part of the process that allowed that to happen. Now, I'd love to fly in space again, but, uh, but I've really had my share also. Chris, great to see you. Great to talk with you again. Thanks so much. We need to take a break right now. When we come back, we'll talk with one of NASA's chief innovators and a space historian. But first, a bit more from Chris Hatfield. Stay with us. You're watching The Heat.